you know, we read things like the 14th Amendment, we think we understand them, but we may miss some of these exclusions and qualifications if we don't think carefully about the context in which they're written and who they're really referring to. Shortly after the 14th Amendment was passed, a new naturalization law was passed in 1870. And if you read the new naturalization law, it becomes very clear who the authors of the 14th Amendment had in mind. Because the new naturalization law offers naturalization to white people and people of African descent. Two categories of people who can naturalize in 1870. White people and people of African descent. That means people who are not born here, who come here, immigrants, um, only those two categories can naturalize. In fact, it really meant only one category could naturalize because there were no people coming from Africa to the United States in the 1870s. In the aftermath of slavery and the slave trade, there was basically zero immigration from Africa into the United States. But there was immigration from other parts of the world into the United States in the 1870s. And all those people who didn't fall into the category white people could not naturalize. So who gets to define what white people are? Who gets to decide what white people are? Notice that those, the two categories, white people and people of African descent, are they parallel categories? Like what sectors of humanity, how do we define who, who is what? Um, Congress really wasn't sure. So it was left to the Supreme Court to decide who was white and who wasn't white. Um, so that between 1870 and the 1920s, we have case after case being brought to the Supreme Court by people of different nationalities claiming whiteness, and the Supreme Court saying, well, actually, whiteness is a national characteristic. So if you're Chinese, it doesn't matter what color your skin is, you can't be white because you are racially Chinese. See the slippage there? Um, what if you're Syrian? Are you racially Syrian and therefore not white? What if you're Italian? Are you racially Italian and therefore not white? So it was the Supreme Court that drew the lines, the geographical lines, the national lines around whiteness. And if we think we know what white means today, it's because of those Supreme Court decisions that legally defined it in the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. But then Congress is faced with a problem because if if they've made it clear that this is a country of white people and they really only want white people to be citizens, they've sort of grudgingly offered citizenship by birth to the descendants of former slaves. What about all those people who aren't white, who are coming to the country, they can't naturalize, but they can have children and then those children will be citizens by birth, so we will no longer be a white country. You can tell that this is what Congress was worried about because almost immediately, three years after passing the new naturalization law, they passed the first racial slash national immigration restriction. And who does it apply to? It applies to Chinese women. The Page Act prohibits the immigration of Chinese women. Chinese men can still come in, but as Congress sees over the years that when you let the men in, they still manage to have children, even if there's no Chinese women, they, they have children outside of their race. Um, all Chinese immigration is prohibited in 1882. After this, other parts of Asia, what we now call Asia, are systematically excluded until 1917, when the Asiatic Barred Zone is created, this is a US law, creates a zone called the Asiatic Barred Zone, covers about three quarters of the world's territory, and nobody from the Asiatic Barred Zone, they're considered to be aliens ineligible to citizenship because they can't naturalize, therefore they're not allowed to come here so they can't, also, they can't become citizenship, citizens by birth, be, referring back to the naturalization law. Well, if they can't naturalize, they're ineligible to citizenship, therefore we shouldn't let them come at all. So the Asiatic Barred Zone, created in 1917, um, many people look back at this period as a period of rather open, especially many white people look back at this period as a period of rather open immigration. Um, it was a period of open immigration for people who the Supreme Court had defined as white, but not to anybody else. So it was a period of 
racially structured immigration laws. The 1917 restriction was uh, reinforced in 1921 and 1924 with the immigration quotas that were applied for the first time to Europeans. And white people love talking about 1921 and 24 as the restrictive immigration laws because they were the first time that restrictions were applied to Europeans. But the restrictions that were applied to Europeans, numerical restrictions, were of course much lesser than the restrictions that had already been in place for decades against people who were not Europeans. So I think we need to completely restructure how we study immigration law. The numerical restrictions in, put into place in 1921 and 1924, decided that the ideal racial composition of the country was in about 1890, before large waves of Southern and Eastern European immigration came in, so that this, we should go back to the census of 1890, measure only Europeans, because they're the only ones we want anyway, but figure out the correct balance of Europeans and then grant each European country a quota based on the proportion that they had in the US population in 1890. Other people who aren't Europeans don't get quotas at all. We just leave them out of the discussion entirely. So quotas on European immigration and nothing for non-Europeans. <laughs> Note that these quotas did not apply to the Western Hemisphere. The Western Hemisphere was not considered part of the Asiatic barred zone. In fact, Migrants from Mexico and other parts of Latin America into the United States were not considered at all under these immigration laws. Remember, of course, also that the United States had taken 50% of Mexico's territory in 1848 and kind of grudgingly granted citizenship to those people not able to figure out what race they belonged to, so whether they were eligible or not to, to citizenship. Puerto Ricans were also granted citizenship in 1917. Um, they kind of got rid of Cuba. They decided it was too dark. Uh, but, but Puerto Ricans were, were considered to be white, whitenable enough to be granted citizenship. So these numerical quotas that allowed only Europeans to immigrate and restricted numbers of Europeans basically governed the immigration system until 1965. In 1965, the system was completely overhauled. Um, this is in the context of post-World War II, of the... Uh, uh, movement against colonialism, against racism. I can see I'm reaching the end of my time here. I'm almost done. Um, uh, a, a way to create what would be seen as equal treatment in the immigration laws, along with desegregation and uh, decolonization and other ways of creating supposedly equal countries and, and, and more equal treatment for people. So the, the, the new quota system that was put into place in 1965 on paper looks very equal. Got rid of all the restrictions, uh, the racial restrictions, and gave every country in the world an equal immigration quota, 20,000. Included the Western Hemisphere for the first time. So 1965 is the very first time there are numerical restrictions on immigration from Mexico or anywhere else in Latin America. Now. Numerical restrictions look equal on paper, but if you stop to think about a map of the world, especially a population map of the world for a moment, you see that while treating all countries equally, they treat all people unequally. Because some parts of the world, in particular Western Europe, are made up of a lot of very tiny little countries. Each of those tiny little countries gets 20,000 immigration quota. That means pretty much anybody from those countries who wants to get an immigrant visa can easily get one. Other countries, like China, India, Indonesia, have close to a billion people in them, and they get the same 20,000 quota. That means that if you come from a place like, say, the Philippines, that has a long colonial history with the United States, that has a huge pent-up system of contracted labor, forced labor, uh, uh, family members in the United States, desire to migrate to the United States, and a huge population, if you want to get an immigrant visa to the United States, your waiting period is likely to be from 80 to 100 years. So treating every country equally doesn't exactly treat every person equally. Now, these quotas uh, 
basically continue to govern our immigration system until today.